welcome to Arizona and Lucid's launch event for its very first car, the Lucid Air sedan. What did you think, Winter? So I'll admit, I was really impressed by the factory tour. It's very clear that you're dealing with a small volume manufacturer at the moment, but just the way the factory is designed, I mean, this is not Henry Ford's assembly line. It's all modular, it's all robots, and it's all designed to be really flexible in a way that I find really, really interesting. Now, we couldn't take cameras around the tour with us. That's fairly standard in the automotive world because automakers want to make sure that you're not gonna run off with their trade secrets. And when there are multi-million dollar robots all carefully programmed, any video footage that wasn't carefully okayed before it left the facility, could give trade secrets away. But hopefully we got some B-roll from the video team here who've already come up and said we can have some. So hopefully that's playing over this I was going to say, right if it now. did, you're probably watching it right now. One of the things that really struck me though, Winter, was the fact that this production line was not necessarily built around speed between each individual station. So your kind of traditional Henry Ford production line Things move down the line at a fair clip, one station to the next station to the next station. And vehicles in a modern production line like you might find with Ford or Volkswagen where you mm -hmm. went last a couple of weeks ago, the amount of time that the vehicle spends at each station is very, very small indeed. And that was not what we saw here at all. They really emphasized how long components and assemblies might be at a station with everything being done to this very, very high level of precision and quality control, which is their objective. The thing that we heard again and again and again, especially with the body itself, was the amount of quality control that goes in. The message that I'm hearing here is that Lucid is very keen not to be like Tesla's early days of production. Well, I think that uh, Peter Rollinson, the CEO of Lucid probably has some emotional baggage from the very early days of Tesla production that he's trying to expunge as he builds Lucid Air. And yeah, I think they really, really, really want these cars to be seen as on the level of luxury and performance cars from established manufacturers, be they Tesla or Mercedes. They don't want people driving these cars and saying, this is a great first effort for a startup. That's very much what they don't want. Now, the first place we toured this morning was the battery and drivetrain production facility. That is where the battery cells, which come from LG Chem right now. They do, although uh, Lucid did say that they are able to work with other manufacturers as well. The batteries are a standard 2170 cylindrical form factor. Right, so those cells arrive, they are tested multiple times, they are put into battery modules, yeah. 300 cells yeah. in a module, and then in the largest pack, the longest range pack, the one that gets you 520 miles, we're talking 22 modules per pack. Simply a staggering number of those little cylindrical batteries. I mean, it's just the same as, as how Tesla makes its packs. Yes, it is, absolutely. It's the same, in fact, that's the same cylindrical form factor that Tesla's currently working with. Uh, and has been all through uh, Model S and Model 3, I believe. But one of the things that we did discover from this was that there's a, been a lot of careful design put into the actual physical components that go into making the car. So for example, the module carrier, each module is a, a basically a, a printed construction. Mm -hmm. We were shown a printed construction that uses plastic, but also metal printed into the case yeah, they try done... and reduce weight and the components. One thing that Lucid has really hammered on uh, throughout the entire day has been their work with plastics, mm. which I find really interesting. They've talked a great deal about their injected plastics and their printed plastics and their molded plastics and the plastics that they've won awards for. And the Three or four uh, different awards. Yeah, actually. the other plastics they've won awards for. It's really remarkable to hear such an emphasis on that. Um, although I was also interested on the metal side in the fact that uh, they use riveted and adhesion 
for construction instead of welding, which I thought was very interesting. Right, because this car is basically aluminium. Most of it yeah. is aluminium. And what we are looking at here is using rivets and, and adhesives rather than traditional welds. Although yeah. there are some points where things are welded. For example, the windows. We were given a little bit yeah. of an explanation. Now, most windows on most cars have to have a lip, a certain amount at the top, between the top of the window and the frame. On this particular car, the designer really wanted it to be really thin. And so they developed a robot that could laser weld with yeah. a handheld tool, yeah. well, not a handheld tool, a robot held tool that could laser weld a line around the top of this door from, seam. From only one side, which is what was really unusual about it, as mm. opposed to one that went around both. Yeah, there's a lot of innovation that went into these cars, and yet there's a lot of it that still felt very just, I'm in a car plant. Yeah, I mean, w when we were wandering around, uh, Winter turned to me and he went, I, I get the impression that you're not super excited. <laughs> I'm like, it's, an, it's another factory tour. It's exciting to see how things are made, but at the same point, there's only so many factory tours that you can go through before you see. So the batteries and the drivetrain are made about six miles away from here in a rented facility. It's a, a facility that Lucid doesn't own, it rents. All of the machines there are floor mounted, so it's really easy for Lucid to rent a facility for that. And eventually Lucid will bring the production here. There's a massive greenfield site here, which is, we're outside AMP1, AMP1, the, the first Lucid production facility. Here is where you have the paint shop, you have all of the body construction, final assembly, all takes place in the buildings behind me. And there's going to be more factory buildings built all around here to bring everything in-house. Because Lucid ships a lot out still at the moment. Yeah. Now, you mentioned our tour of the battery and drivetrain plant, and I feel like we can't touch on this car and not talk about the thing that jumped out at both of us, which is the motor system on this car. Right, it's incredibly <laughs> small. So I, I drive a 2011 uh, Think City, which has 46 horsepower and is objectively not a very good car. Its motor gearbox is notably larger than the integrated inverter motor gearbox for the Lucid, which produces over 500 brake horsepower out of a package that I am not exaggerating, you could pretty much put in a carry-on bag to bring onto an airplane. Although it weighs about 160 pounds. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. So you it, wouldn't, it would be a bit but size-wise, I mean, it's stunningly compact. Let's talk about the stator and the also the rotor. Ah, so we yeah. saw that the stator is robot wound. Yeah. Very, very tightly robot wound. We didn't get a straight answer on how many, how many windings. I not. think that might have been proprietary. And also the, the rotor, they have a special machine that spins the rotor up. To That's balance pretty it, yeah. standard in the automotive world to balance it to make sure everything works. But it was very interesting seeing that process and seeing how it all fitted together. And, and we were told that they fit together unbelievably closely. The clearance we were told between the rotor and the stator is one millimeter, right? which is incredible. For all you Americans watching, that's a very small amount. <laughs> we've, ha we've talked about the, the factory tour now. Let's talk about the design, because this is your first time seeing the Lucid. In the flesh. In the metal. Yeah. Tell me what you think. So much, I appreciate it. The Lucid is an absolutely beautiful car from three sides. From the front, I think the front of the Lucid is absolutely stunning. I think the side profile is, is generally quite, quite nice. And I think the less said about the back of the car, the better. Which is unusual because normally it's the bottom that gets attention. Certainly my attention, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about this massive windscreen. It sweeps up for seemingly forever. There is a scene that you can't see. It's just, just up yeah. there. Massive, massive glass, uh, front windscreen and kind of goes into the roof. I've sat in a Lucid Air, obviously. I was lucky enough to get a, a first ride with David Lickfold earlier on this year yeah. in a prototype. Later on, both of us will hopefully get to drive it. But that gives you really amazing views of the road ahead. And it's very much like that massive front windscreen in the Tesla Model X. Or the Tesla Model Y, I believe, as well. I, I'll be honest. There are a lot of things about the Lucid 
that I look at and I very much see the influence of Tesla. Um, and that makes some sense in part because Peter Rawlinson and also because I think Lucid really is hoping to appeal to the Tesla buyer. I think I, I suspect that a higher percentage of buyers of Lucids will be coming from other EVs compared to say the VW ID4 where more than 80% of buyers are coming from internal combustion cars. I think this car is really, at least in the beginning, going to be taking market from people who are already familiar with EV ownership. And I think that makes a lot of sense when you talk about what this car offers. It is, I think, based on my experience so far, a much more refined experience than the Tesla Model S was in its early days. Yeah. I don't know if that compares to the Plaid. I'm very eager to get behind the wheel of a Plaid after having gotten behind the wheel of this. I think that will be a really fun comparison. And I think it's one of the comparisons that a lot of people are making. I think when you talk about the Lucid, I think the breath you're going to talk about the Lucid is going to be the Model S and Model S Plaid and the Porsche Taycan and maybe the Mercedes EQS. I think yep. that's the strata and market that this car is really going for. And what's interesting about it is that this is a startup. Yeah. Are people yeah. who have the money to buy Model S Plaid, to buy EQS, to buy Taycan, are they going to be excited for a car whose numbers are in the tens instead of tens of thousands? Well, we're looking at between I, th I think we're looking at between five and six hundred cars this year. That's my yeah. understanding off the production line. And then after that, yeah. who knows? One of the interesting figures we learned today was when the second production line gets running, where the SUV version of this will be built, the, the gravity. gravity, yeah, we will be seeing a capacity of 90,000 cars a year. Though they were really clear that that's a capacity of 90,000 cars a year, but not necessarily an expectation that at least in the foreseeable future, they'll be producing 90,000 cars a year. I think there's a lot of things besides capacity that go into your ability to produce 90,000 cars a year. It's very exciting. It I think is. you're totally right on the production volume, but then it's a luxury, premium luxury car. It's oh, not yeah. going to ever be made, I don't think, in the kind of volumes that we're seeing Tesla I'm, make Model 3. I'm really hoping that we see technology from Lucid, from the Lucid Air, trickle down into somewhat yeah. more accessible cars, especially this incredibly compact, incredibly powerful motor. There's going to be a presentation inside from CEO Peter Rawlinson momentarily, so we're going to go inside and catch that. But then we get a ride. Hopefully a drive. Fingers crossed. So we've got our masks on, obviously, because of COVID practice being nice to other people, even though Arizona seems to have a problem wearing masks in normal everyday life. And I'm here with Esther, who is one of the engineers on the air. This is my first time driving it. It's got a very measured throttle response. It's not a response that makes you feel that you've got all the power you actually have under your right foot. In fact, you are it's in smooth nice. mode. I'm in smooth mode right now, and I'm single pedal driving to a complete and utter stop. Now, winter's in the back, and... Oh my goodness. Wow. And that's, that's in smooth. That is in smooth. We are in the Lucid Air Dream Edition range. It's the one that has the incredible 520 mile EPA range, but you know what? Still pretty quick. It's still very quick. The steering wheel is, is very pleasant. And I think the thing that really strikes me as it did last time when I rode in a Lucid Air was how quiet it is. The seats are very comfortable. I can't speak for the back. Winter, what do you think? So I was really excited to ride in the back of this car because to be honest, there's going to be a significant percentage of buyers who are pretty much never going to drive one of these. And the back is interesting. So there is plenty of leg room, but as we've seen with a lot of other EVs, I feel a bit like my knees are at my chest because you have a very high floor because of the battery pack. I'm not a terribly tall person. I'm about five foot nine. I think if I was really tall, this would actually be properly unpleasant. Um, it is, the seats are very nice. 
Um, it is not nearly as quiet back here as I think I expected it would be. Um, it's There's quite a bit of road noise. Um, we are going about 65 miles an hour. Um, it is, the materials are all very nice. The build quality is fantastic. It feels very premium. Dare I say, it does feel somewhat luxury. Um, and I can, I can stretch my legs out a little bit, but for a very large car, um, I find that I feel cramped in a way that I had not expected. Um, it's a, the back seat is a bit of a letdown for what I was expecting it to be. Now, I've never ridden in the back seat winter, so I'm going to say I'm going to be interested to see what it feels like when I get behind the back seat there. I think the thing that I have noticed here from the, 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 the driving position is that while everything is within easy reach here, I have noticed that we're losing some of the little cluster here on the left in terms of, of controls. Is it behind your, is it clouded at all by the steering it wheel? It is a little bit, but that might just be my position. Oh. We can, oh, yeah, we can do that. But it's actually a good chance for me to check the, there you go. I nearly overcooked the, uh, the turning there. And the turning circle on the air is actually very good. I was very impressed by that. I don't have the figures to hand, but obviously this is a first drive report rather than a I want to see how it handles proper, this turn. A proper, a proper kind of full blown review. Winter says he wants to know how this handles the turn. Let's see. That was a very, very quick acceleration. Peter Rawlinson did tell us last night that he wanted you to push this car around. I mean, this is the fastest and most powerful electric car I've driven, full stop. The closest I've driven in terms of power to this point is the Porsche Taycan. And I know a lot of people will say, well, yeah, you haven't driven the Plaid Model S. No, but if you have a Plaid Model S, call us because both Winter and I do want to get Absolutely. some time behind the wheel. The thing that I've noticed with this is that it doesn't feel like it's hard work. No. It just happens. And I think it was probably less than a second to go from 60 to 70. Oh goodness, easily. I mean, that's the thing. A lot of EVs pull hard from zero to 60. But the, the thing that sort of marks these performance high-end cars like the Plaid and the Taycan and this are the ability to still pull really hard once you're already going 60 or 70 miles an hour. I totally agree with what you just said, Winter. I will also say that this headrest in this car is very nice. It's very plush and comfortable, plenty of adjustable lumbar support. And frankly, it doesn't feel like I'm driving a big, heavy car. It, it really does not. And, you know, it's, even right now, it's still showing 314 miles of remaining range, which is what, f nearly 500 kilometers yeah, on and, the top of my head? and a mix of journalists and investors and early purchasers have been wailing on these cars all day. Right, and the important thing to note here is that since its last charge, it's averaged 1.9 miles per kilowatt hour. <laughs> But when you pull zero to 100 mile an hour sprints, which I suspect a lot of people have done, it really doesn't, it's surprising, really. I would love to know in like normal, reasonable driving what this car's mile per kilowatt ends mm. up being. I will say from back here, you have a very heavily tinted uh, roof and it is quite, quite, quite lovely. Um, it is very heavily tinted and yet I still uh, really would rather see a retracting sunshade be an option like it was on say ID4. So you'd rather still have a retracting sunshade? Even though it's heavily tinted I would still like to have a retracting sunshade yeah I would. It is and the sun definitely does beat down on the back here from through that rear window. And the yeah, rear it's window, not tinted at the back how as is, much. How is visibility through the rear window? Because from here it looks relatively small. It's very good actually. Excellent. This is a nice curved. Yeah. This is a nice curved window here. One nice thing to note here is that there are cameras in each of the side rear view mirrors, and when you indicate, you get a, an image on the driver's dash showing you that camera. It's something that the Japanese automakers have done a lot of over the years, but it's a really nice touch in the Lucid Air. 
And I think it's something that all automakers should do because it really helps you with that blind spot monitoring. It's something that Hyundai and Kia have done in the new Ionic 5 and EV6 as well. The ride here is very smooth. You know, even if you accelerate, even if you brake hard, the car, it doesn't move around too much. I'm going around this corner kind of quite hard because I want to see if there's any body roll. There's no body roll. Not a smidge. I mean, I'm, I did that at 50 and it really didn't care. And then straight back up to beyond merging speed. I mean, it's truly impressive how quick this car is. It is really, I mean, we've been going over it sort of uh, ribbing, you know, notifying you of speed changes. And uh, it is very, very smooth back here. It, it really is like the, the, be the ride quality itself is quite good. Um, I, as viewers know, I am not exactly a big fan of SUVs, but I do think uh, from back seat comfort standpoint, if the comfort and smoothness of this car translates well to an SUV where maybe my knees don't have to be quite so high into my chest, I think that that will be a really good place to be for a backseat passenger. I'm, I'm very interested to see the back seats on the gravity when the gravity comes to, into being. I would not want to go for a really long ride, I don't think, in the backseat of this car. I mean, if I cross my legs, it gets better, but... Now, when you're in swift mode, you have less regenerative braking than when you're in smooth mode, but it is fully adjustable. So you could probably set up a custom profile and keep it there with more regenerative braking. That's what I would want to do. We're going around this off-ramp a lot more slowly than we did the previous one. And again, there's no body roll at all. It no. really is excellent body control with this vehicle. You should probably note that this car is running on, I'm not entirely sure which, which size wheels these are. I'm gonna go with 19 inch wheels, uh, which it would probably be for the range. And the tire size on that is 245, which is very narrow for a car this big with this much power on the road. Yeah, you noted that when we were uh, in the factory. One thing that kind of does strike me is how big this car is, and you do really feel how big it is. You've got those lovely big hips as you're driving along, and anyone who's watched this channel before will know I'm a fan of big car hips, and I think they're just super sexy. And you can see them out of both of the rear view mirrors. I love this wonderful full length windscreen that comes all the way back to, to match up with the B pillar here. And it gives you just a really lovely panoramic view of the road ahead. I'm gonna get in the back now and give Winter a chance to drive. Hey. It's all yours, Winter. So we've just switched and Winter is now behind the seat. A couple of things that we learned while we stopped. The regen is adjustable and we've just switched it so that Winter now has a much higher level of regenerative braking than I did. So this is going to be fun for you, Winter. Yeah, I mean, I'm going 10 miles an hour if I take my foot off. I mean, we, we slow down very aggressively. It feels like you're, like you're really putting the brakes on. So this is the Lucid Air Dream Edition range, which has the larger battery pack. And that's one of the reasons why Winter thought that the height of the floor in the rear of the Lucid Air was a little high. If you go for the standard battery pack on the more affordable Lucid Air, there's actually extra space in the rear for rear passenger feet because it doesn't have the double decker battery pack. And that obviously means that you've got a little bit more space to play with. I'm pretty sure that winter's about to hoof it when we get round this corner. I might, corner. I might. I'll so take be prepared for me to scream like a little girl. The Can You Make Your Boss Pass Out Challenge of 2021. Which, considering I have a heart condition, so is going to be quite hard. But I'm going to do what jet fighter got pilots some, do. Got some feedback on the, uh, on the lane keep assist. That's interesting. Stay in this lane? All right, so if I just, if I just wanna... That was on. there we go. And that's really hard regen. See, the really <laughs> hard regen is really interesting. If I let the car ease off a bit, because there's no one behind me, you know, slow it down a little bit, a little Three, comically, and two. then... Yeah, and then do that. I mean, this car just has an enormous amount of power and 
you don't feel it at all. Nikki said that this is a car which is very easy to go very fast in. If you're accustomed to something like a Tesla Model 3, you're used to a car which, as you get going really quick, you start to really feel it in the NVH. And this car, you don't. This car at, no. you know, this, this car going 85 miles an hour and this car going 35 miles an hour basically feels exactly the same. And the, the difference in cabin noise is minimal as it, well. Yeah, is also negligible. And um, I will say, when you really, really hit this car hard, which to be honest, if I owned it, I don't think I'd do very often, um, because actually the acceleration curve in smooth is really nice. Uh, the thing that I will say really tickles me is that uh, when you really punch this car, you get the most delightful, very subtle whine out of the motor, which is completely yep. uh, invisible in normal driving. Uh, we're going just a bit over the speed limit now, and I hear nothing from the motor. In fact, the only noise I'm hearing really is tire noise. But if you really floor it, you get that little, little whine out of the engine. And that's something that people were really worried about when Nikki did her first uh, ride along with David Lickfold was that uh, the car had quite a lot of motor whine. And at the time, David said that refining the experience of the perceptual motor whine in the cabin was something that Lucid was working on. And I think absolutely oh boy. in this boy car, has it. yeah, you really, really see it. Like they clearly put a lot of work into it and that work really paid off in a way that, that's absolutely lovely. And I would add to what Winter just said and note that the the riding experience here is much improved on the, the beta prototype that I rode in back in, it would have been March. And there's been a lot of changes that have happened to the car since then. The interior is a lot more quiet. Obviously everything feels much more carefully put together. There's no noticeable rattles or any noises from inside the cabin. No, although There's we are, just a we little getting, bit of wind noise here yeah. from the C-pillar, but nothing else. We are definitely getting some wind noise, although I think we have to be fair and say that yes, we're getting wind noise. We also have GoPros strapped to the outside of the car, which certainly contributes to some of the wind perceptible yeah, wind absolutely. noise. absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I have to say, the ride is incredibly good for a car riding on coilover springs. If you didn't know better, you would easily think that this car was riding on air suspension um, because it is very compliant. We're going into some bumps now, and I definitely know that I'm going over them. It's not wafting like a 1970s Lincoln, but then again, it also doesn't have any body roll like a 1970s Lincoln would. So to me, that's a very fair trade-off. How um, do you find the, uh, the steering feedback on, on Corners Winter? Because I felt that it was very direct. Um, it is very direct, but still has that modern synthetic feel to it. Um, you know, you still really know you're in a car with, you know, a lot between you and the wheels. But it is, it's very good. The weight is nice. I think it has quite good on center feel. Um, it's not too, too sensitive. The car centers well. I do really like how it drives. Uh, at the same time, I definitely feel like this is a car that will cross shop against uh, a Porsche Taycan. This is a car that will cross shop against a uh, Model S Plaid. I don't know that this car is going to cross shop against an EQS. It doesn't ride to me or drive to me like a luxury car. Uh, it, the interior feels very luxury, um, or at least it feels very, very, very premium. But this is, this is the ride of a car built to be a brilliant driving machine with a good deal of comfort. It is not a luxury ride to me. Um, it's, and it's I don't know that it's, I don't know that it, it says, I'm not know that it says it wants to be. It's just interesting. I, I find that from the passenger seat, it's very comfortable. Yes, but, but is it but is it luxury the way that you expect out of a Mercedes S Class? And I that, think I think it's very difficult to tie that down primarily because the S Class has changed so much. That's true. And the EQS is such a different car 
to anything that went before it. Now we're hopefully gonna get some time with the EQS in uh, a month or so. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that yeah. actually happens. I mean, I would, this very much is what I would choose over a real luxury, luxury car, because I like a car that drives brilliantly and this drives brilliantly. Um, I don't love that I'm losing big chunks of my screen because the steering wheel. Um, I feel like that's something that people complained about in the Porsche Taycan, which has a very similar dash. Uh, and I feel like it's something that I'm, I'm experiencing in this car as well. Um, but hey, between you and I, we've managed to increase our fuel efficiency, <laughs> despite driving uh, pretty bonkers, quickly. Which really makes you wonder how bonkers the other people driving this poor thing have been. It, so one thing I, I really, really like about this car is that I can drive this car uh, stupid. I can drive this car ridiculously, but it doesn't feel like I have to. Like, I am cruising along at 75 in a 75 zone and I feel really good doing it. I don't feel like the only way to enjoy this car is to, you know, to push a nickel and take the corners at twice the speed limit. I feel like this is a car that I can just enjoy the way it is, and I do really appreciate that. And it has a real wheel. It does have those, there is a full circle to the wheel. That said, I haven't gotten to drive a plaid with its yoke yet. I'm excited to do so. Maybe I'll fall madly in love with it. I, I don't think like I will. Like we say, call this. I will say this, I was very prepared for this to feel like the car from a startup. I mean, let's be honest. When this car rolled off the assembly line, I don't imagine Lucid had made very many cars yet, and it doesn't show at all. So one of the things to talk about in the rear of the car is that, oh, whoa, that's very fast. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, that, that ended up being faster than I thought it was. I glanced at the road for a moment away from my speedo and realized I was going a bit quicker than I planned. This car at mumble mumble speed feels like this car at 40 and that is it a is, remarkable achievement and could really get you in some trouble. I, I want to take this to the autobahn in Germany and do a real <laughs> long distance autobahn trip with it. I think it would be absolutely splendid for that. I think so too. Let's talk about the rear seat area. I think there's a lot of leg room laterally, just not a lot height wise. Obviously that's because of the extended battery pack that this version of the Lucid Air has but you've got a touchscreen display right down here that gives you access to independent climate control for the two outermost rear seat passengers. So the person next to me, if there was someone sitting next to me, could have a different temperature air conditioning to what I would have. There's a vent in the B pillar. There's also a vent in the center console, so you can have two different sources of air. You also have heated seats, independent uh, independently operated and you have complete control over what the air conditioning is doing in the back of the car and for that reason I think Winter this is one of the reasons why I think this would make a great long distance executive luxury car I think it would be quite easy to sit in the back of this car have a driver up front and be doing my my conference call be doing my my telephone call maybe even catching up on some newspapers or something like that without really necessarily having to look up. And because there's so little body roll in this car, because there's so little noticeable feel in the rear, it's not a car in which I believe that you would feel particularly sick in terms of motion sickness. One of the challenges of motion sickness is that sudden change, unexpected change in your inner ear. But because this car rides so smoothly and so flatly, I think it would be kind of hard, unless you were someone who really suffered very badly from motion sickness, to feel that unless you had a driver who was a sadist. So I really like this car, but I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about one thing that's really, really bugging me, and that's this windshield. This windshield is, it's not good. It's not clear. There's a there's there's ripple and wave. I saw it from the back seat up here, and I thought, well, that's fine if it's up there. But it's in my field of view also, and it's really, really, really bothering me. That's something which I think can relatively easily be addressed. Um, but I, if I test drove this car with my checkbook in my hand, 
I think I'd walk away from it just because of the piece of glass that I'm looking through. The and interesting thing that got me was the indicator stalk, which I didn't like. They don't bother me that much. I mean, they feel, uh, the indicator stalks feel a bit cheap. Um, not terribly so, they're all short for my taste. Um, and the little like cameras popping up isn't always, didn't seem super consistent. The right side one didn't work just now. Um, but now that the car in front of me is warping and waving as, uh, as our angle to it changes, and that's really, really, really bothering me. Now, I'm, I'm both a photographer and someone who wears glasses, so I'm very sensitive about my glass, but this is honestly pretty terrible. It is the only thing in this car which is terrible. Other than that, Everything else about this car I have absolutely loved, except for my rear seat leg position. And again, if I was going to buy one of these, which I can't because I don't have the money, uh, I would just buy one with a shorter range battery pack and the better rear seat comfort. Or I would say, it's my car, I'm going to drive it, deal, to whoever was sitting in the rear seat. Because honestly, this is an, a, an absolutely brilliant car to drive. And you know, headroom in the rear is fine for me. I'm an average height person. I think if I was a little taller, I might struggle a bit here. But again, you know, at the front, much more headroom than there is in the rear. I don't feel cramped back here. And I agree with everything Winter said. This is a fabulous car and it is a stunning example of a first vehicle from a brand new automaker and I've experienced two different automakers in the last two weeks who've managed to do this you know Rivian a couple of weeks ago up in the Rockies off-roading in a brand new vehicle that felt like it had come from a mainstream automaker that had been that? in production for years and years oh, and straight. years and now we're doing exactly the same thing now in a Lucid Air this is a company which is making its very first vehicle. And I think that this is better than where the Tesla Model S was in 2012. No ifs, no buts, no ands. This is better than the Model 3 was when it first rolled off the production line. No ifs, no buts, no ands. The question is, if it's this good as it's just coming off the production line now, what is it going to be like in a couple of years time? Just that, as the Model S and the Model 3 and the Model Y have improved over time, I expect this car to improve over time too. That is, if Lucid makes it. We know that the overwhelming majority of automotive startups don't. Now, I personally think that Lucid has a much better shot than most automotive startups in terms of, you know, making it to sustained production for the next, you know, decade plus, uh, I think Lucid is really well positioned to be successful. But I think that time will still have to tell. Startups are hard and getting a car into production is the absolute biggest hurdle, but it's not the last hurdle. And I, I sincerely, sincerely hope that Lucid uh, continues to build on what they've already shown us because this is such a brilliant start. So there you have it. Lucid Air is now officially launched. Cars are now rolling off the production line. Cars are going to customers. And we got to drive a very quick, very fine vehicle, despite our very specific nitpicks, Winter. Indeed, I, we did have a few nitpicks, but overall I was legitimately really, really, really impressed with the car. I mean, it is a fabulous automobile, as to be honest, it should be for the price point. Absolutely. and. <laughs> I think the other thing to bear in mind here is that this is a brand new automaker. Doesn't feel like it. with people who have worked in the automotive industry collaboratively, collectively, for centuries. Yeah. There are hundreds of years of automotive industry experience in this company. It's not a Silicon Valley startup that just wants to be a Silicon Valley startup. So you know what I was thinking of going through the factory tour and everything else? I was thinking of Dyson. I was thinking of when Dyson, the vacuum manufacturer, said, we're going to make an electric car. We know electric motors, we make vacuums. How hard can it be? And the reality is no one in this company, I think, ever had the thought, how hard could it be to make a car? And I it think shows. It really does. This is a company of people who entered this saying, this is tough, but we have the background to know how to do it. And they 
they have done it. We have driven it. We see uh, in the comment section on our videos quite a bit when Lucid comes up, we've had a lot of people say, ah, they're still vaporware. They're never going to deliver to customers. No, no, it's, it's a real It's car. right here. We've driven it. Car. And they have started, as of today, they are starting deliveries to customers. And that is super exciting. But Nikki's right. Now, it remains to be seen. Can this be a car company that follows in Tesla's footsteps and makes the enormously difficult transition from startup to true automaker? And I think all the ingredients are there. I just, time's gonna tell. Thank you so much to Lucid for letting us be here. We were able to be here thanks to Lucid. As usual, they covered airfare, lodgings, and meals. Let us know what you think. Would you like this car to come to New Zealand? Would you buy it? Is it too big for Kiwi roads? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to sign up to New Zealand's only Carbon Zero Certified Renewable Electricity Company. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. And I'm Winter Tashton. Kakite. See you next time.